to start, and I'm, I'm going to ask you guys to get into groups of two or three. And with that, we're going to play a little game to kind of start us off. Okay, it's 100 degrees outside and we're stuck in a gym, right? So we got to get the blood, the, the juices flowing a little bit, right? Okay, so here we go. What I want you guys to do, okay, get in groups of two or three, okay? So find a partner right now, go for it. All right, you guys got a partner, okay? You're actually going to talk in chapel today a little bit, all right? Okay, and I can't, I didn't print paper out for every, everybody, but if we were in a classroom, I'd probably have you guys draw this out, okay? But here's something on the board, okay? And with this, what I want you guys to think through is how would you complete the drawing, okay? So the person on the right, complete the one on the right. The person on the left, complete the one on the left. If you're in a group of three or four, just, just pick one and just, how would you complete it, okay? And just explain to the other person what you would do to complete it and what it is in the end. Is that all right? Okay, I'm gonna give you guys about 30 seconds. Go for it. All right. Well, if I could gather us back together, this is called, okay, the, this test is actually called the Torrance Test of Creativity, okay? And it's given to little kids to measure how creative they are, okay? So here are some examples of what uh, little kids drew. So here's, here's an example. All right, so one became a whale. And a spider, that's pretty good. Any whales and spiders in here? No? Okay. All right, here's another one. Okay, one became a fish and a horse. That's pretty cool, right? Here's another one. Big fish, and this one is a T-Mobile, you know, the, the big wobbly guy, right? That's pretty cool, right? That's pretty cool, okay? Here's another one. That one's called Fish Eating Fish, and that one's called The Clown, right? Okay, and I think uh, this one's pretty awesome, right? The guy's balancing up there, and this one becomes a new friend. And here's, here's the best one. Here's the best one I think they, they decided. Out of the box thinking a little bit, and it's like a gesture or something like that, okay? Hey, you know... For creativity, okay, incompleteness is actually a really good thing, okay? But when we live out the gospel, living it out incompletely, it's actually not a good thing. The whole gospel is actually very challenging. The whole gospel. I think sometimes we as Christians, we live out one part of the gospel and we forget the other. And other Christians, we live out another part of the gospel and we forget the other. And what happens is these two different groups of Christians, we start attacking each other and say, you guys aren't living out the gospel when in fact they're living out two different parts of the gospel. But here at Biola, what we want to do is we want to say that we want to live out the whole gospel, the complete thing. So I'm going to ask you guys to open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, okay? And we're going to go over verses 16 through 18 today, okay? So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 16 through 18, okay, and if I could be honest with you guys, I have an anxiety as I share today, and I also have an assurance, okay? The anxiety I come into this chapel today is that when we read this passage and as we discuss it today, that we're going to listen to this passage with our political lenses, okay, and kind of like forget some of it, but I'm going to ask us to see the whole gospel here. The other, the assurance I have, though, is that, you know, this is actually the Bible. That as much as we want to compartmentalize or only live out part of the gospel, I think the challenge for us is to see the whole thing. And the assurance is that I believe that the Holy Spirit is working through it, and the Word of God is pretty clear. So here's verse 16. Okay, I'm going to read it for us. And just follow along. It's going to be right here on the screen. It says this. And in one body... To reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came, Jesus came, and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Now here's the thing with this passage. I'm going to highlight a few things, okay? And I think these are the themes of the passage. And the cool thing about this passage, as we make a few observations, one observation is that we start mid-sentence. Isn't that kind of weird? 
right? We start mid-sentence, okay? So I'm going to get us to the whole paragraph of this passage. Okay, and these are the themes. And if you look at the whole passage, okay? And again, it's a little color-coded, okay? As we look at the whole passage, what you're going to notice is that the blues are like the sandwiches, and then the pinks are kind of like next. And then it, it kind of does this thing called a chiasm. Okay, what a chiasm is a, is a way of describing, especially in the Bible, where you say things over to emphasize what's in the middle. For example, if I say Mike loves Mary, who loves Mike, okay, that's a chiasm. Mike loves Mary, who loves Mike. The goal or the emphasis is Mary, okay, and the point is to focus on who Mary is, who is my wife, okay. So I want to kind of lay out the chiasm for you, okay. So the blues, and then it goes down, and the focus is peace, okay? And what we want to do today, okay, and I want to boil down as best as I can the gospel into two components, okay? And that's going to be what's in green, okay, this idea of two groups being one, one new humanity out of the two, one body to reconcile both of them, this green idea, this idea in some sense of racial reconciliation. Jews and Gentiles are called to come together, okay? For us in this world, so divided, all of us are, co- are called to come together as one, one body, one new humanity out of the two. And the second idea is peace with God. Peace. In fact, in this whole paragraph, peace is repeated four times. So the, if you notice the purple, and the pink, and the orange, they kind of go with the green, and the blue is going to go with the yellow as well. So let's break this down together, and what we want to talk about is the whole gospel. We want to talk about two into one, and we want to talk about peace. So first, let's talk about the green. Two groups into one. Now, you know what? I know some of you guys might be sick of talking about race, but I want to say one thing as we start. I want you guys to notice with me. This was written 2,000 years ago. This has been in the Bible for a lot longer than we've been around. And you know what? The cool thing is, is that it's still relevant today. And as much as we don't want to recognize race, as much as we don't want to talk about it, it's in our world. It is there. It divides us. Okay? The Jew and Gentile division was real back then, and the, the race division that we experience in America is real today. It's crazy to think, 2,000 years ago, God knew to put that in the Bible, and it still hits us at our most relevant parts. So you got the far, you got the near. You got the Jew, you got the Gentile, you got yourself, and you got the other, and through the cross... God reconciles any sort of barrier between race, ethnicity, and culture. What Ephesians tells us is that this barrier is in fact hostility. Okay, there's a barrier between these races. It's hostility toward each other. This barrier is hostility we have toward the other person who is not like us. And usually that hostility is a way that we look, we look down on the bad things that they bring. For example... Why do they smell like that? How come all those people are homeless? They're so lazy. Why do they wear a towel on their head? What in the world are they eating? Hostility definitely is the bad things we look down on other people. But you know what? I think Paul is telling us something else here. What Paul is telling us is as actually too much pride in our good. For example, what Paul is saying here is that this hostility is coming from the law. Okay, now, in the Old Testament, the law is actually a good thing, okay? If you read Deuteronomy, if you read Proverbs, if you read Romans 7, all these places throughout the Bible, the law is actually a good thing. And the Jews were supposed to live out the law, and as they lived out the law, they were supposed to invite the cultures and the people around them into that relationship with God. But instead, what did the Jews do? They used the good of the law to say, we are good, and they looked down on other people. They looked at the good of themselves, and they did not use it as a way to invite people into that relationship. They used it as a way to say that they're superior 
over other people. Hostility then isn't just the bad things about other people, it's the things that we have inordinate pride of too much of the good in ourselves. We take the best things, the good in ourselves, and we make it normative. And we look down on other people rather than celebrate the gift that God has given us and invite people to enjoy that with us. We're smarter than those people. We're better at math than those people. We have the right skin tone. We're more polite and courteous. I think C.S. Lewis says it best. He says this. He says, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having it more than the next person. We see that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking -er than others. You know, we become like the Pharisee in Luke 18. A Pharisee in Luke 18 says, God, thank you that I'm not like those people, those robbers, those evildoers, those adulterers. I fast twice a week and I donate tons of money. It's not only focusing on the bad, but it's focusing on this inordinate pride in who we are. Honest question. What if the position that that other person is in, that other person from that other race, from that other ethnic background, from that other cultural background, is not wrong, but just different? Now, I'm not saying everything about another culture is not morally wrong or spiritually acceptable. That's not what I'm saying. There are definitely wrongs and rights in every single culture, okay? But for the most part, what if they developed certain life habits because of the cultural, social, and ethnic lot they were given? The social, ethnic, and cultural lot that they were born into. You know, when I was around 12, okay, we went out to eat with my family after Sunday, Okay? And after Sunday, we went to church in Koreatown in L.A. I grew up in Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, we went to the food court. Okay? So when I was growing up, the food court, there's a lot of food courts in K-Town now, but the food court back then was called K-Town Plaza. Okay? So K-Town Plaza is underneath. It's kind of like a dungeon. Okay? So we all went to this food court called the K-Town Plaza. And in this food court, there's all these different vendors. Okay? And they sell all different kinds of Korean food. Okay? And we're sitting there, and we're eating, and we're eating, and we're eating, and, you know, I, it's really good. I, I, I love eating Korean food, right? I'm Korean, so I, like, I love it. And then I remember seeing this lady, okay, get her food, okay, from one place and carry it on a tray, okay, and she slipped, and her food went flying everywhere. And my first reaction was, you know what, I need to go and help her. So I got out of my chair, and my mom grabbed my hand. And said, Mike, Anjo. She said, Mike, sit down. And in my head, I'm like, what? Aren't we supposed to be a Christian and help that person who just became a fool in front of everybody? And she said, Mike, Mike, Choyang, yeah. She said, be quiet. She said, Mike, ignore them. And I'm like, what is going on in here? Like, why? This person is cleaning up her mess. And you know what I noticed? Everyone, everything got really silent when she dropped her, her plates and every, all the food went flying. But after about like five seconds, everyone went back to eating. And no one did anything. All the Koreans and Asians in that food court just ignored her. And you know what? That was the thing to do. That was the right thing to do in Asian cultures, I think. See, you know, I never understood it until a little bit later. But see, I was born in America. I was taught by Western teachers, okay? I watched Western TV. And so as I was raised with these Western values, I started to understand, you know what? My job is to inculcate Western values in that situation. And my job was to go down and meet her face to face and make sure she's okay and clean up the mess with her. See, Western values in terms of when there's, a, when there's shame involved, you go and meet that person face to face. And you confront them and you ask them if they're okay. And you try to restore them in a personal way. You know what I learned? I learned that as Korean people, as Asian people, as Eastern people, who come from honor-shame cultures, the best thing to do is just ignore them. 
It doesn't mean that I don't care about them. It's actually I'm ignoring them because I care about them. It's actually what I'm saying is, hey, you know what? Your shame, I'm going to ignore it because I don't want you to feel the shame. And that was weird to me. But you know what? Is the Western way more right? Is the Eastern way more right? You know what? They're both right and they're both wrong. But are they different? Is it simply that they're different? And you know what? I think it is. Here's the thing about the gospel. It's not saying that the Jews, the Gentiles, it's not saying that Asians or Westerners, it doesn't say that we need to forget our ethnic, racial, and cultural identities. But it's saying that our unifying force is the cross, it's the blood of Christ, it's the life we have in the spirit. So question, how do we do that? Okay, and that's where we're going to go to the focal point of our chiasm. It's this idea of peace with God. How do we do that? How do we reconcile the races? It's, you know what, we have to understand what peace with God looks like. I'm going to give three wrong ideas of peace, and then we're going to unpack what peace looks like a little bit, okay? The first wrong idea of peace, okay, is the lack of conflict, okay? So I've been married 10 years now. And you know, thank you, thank you. One person's happy for me, okay? So we've been married for 10 years, and guess what? Here's a little secret, okay? We still fight, okay? And in fact, we still fight a lot. Thank you for more cheers there. Thank you, appreciate that, okay? And you know, sometimes we think that if we would just stop fighting, things would be better. You know, I think she would agree with me. You know, I think we both agree that a lack of conflict would seem like a little bit better. But, you know, in the end, you know what fighting does for us? It makes us feel like we have a better way to learn to communicate with each other. It forces us to communicate to the other person. Okay, a lack of conflict would mean that we've stopped trying. We've stopped trying to understand the other person. So the first wrong idea of peace is this lack of conflict, okay? The conflict in our world is actually an opportunity for us to engage peace. Sometimes peace comes through conflict, and it's not the absence of conflict. The second idea, okay, is that if I rearrange things in my life, things will automatically get more peaceful, okay? Let me explain something to you. This is my last name in Chinese, okay? So Korean names come from Chinese characters. Okay? This is my last name. It's On. Thank you. Okay? And that, that actually means peace. Kind of cool, right? Okay? And On means peace, okay? And I want to make something really clear. I don't believe in the, what I'm going to say right now. Okay? So this is the wrong way to look at peace, okay? So what on is, okay, and this is what my dad taught me when I was young. And I was like, what in the world? Okay, so that bottom character, okay, it's actually two characters. There's the top character and the bottom character, but it's one word, okay, one character in Chinese. That bottom character actually means woman or wife, okay? Okay, and that top character means house, okay? So what my dad taught me is when the woman is in the house, there is peace, Okay? Now, again, I don't want to, that's not correct. I'm not saying that, okay? But this idea here, what my dad was trying to teach me, okay, in in the Asian cultures, they might seem like this is true, okay? There's some historical truth possibly in, in in, in, in Asian history. But this illustration, I think, gets at the wrong idea of peace because what it's saying is that if we rearrange things in life and we get everything in order, then we're gonna have peace. You know, that's not, that's not peace. That's just us being control freaks. Control might feel like peace, but it is not peace that's described in the Bible. I think the third approach to peace, okay, is that we approach peace like we're sick people needing to get better. I think that's a good posture. I think Jesus affirms that in Matthew 9. But this passage reminds us that first and foremost, we're not sick people, but we're actually dead people. The best word in the whole Bible comes in Ephesians 2, and it comes twice. And it's the word but. That word but starts off our paragraph in verse 13, and it echoes verse 4, which says this, but because of his great love for us, 
not good love for us, but great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, doesn't have lots of mercy, mercy, but he's rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in transgressions. It doesn't say we were sick in transgressions, but we were dead. It is by grace you have been saved. See, when we're sick, to get peace, we, dr- we rest, we drink fluids, we get medicine, we, get, we eat better, we get better. When we're dead, how do you get better? You can't. There's nothing we can do to get better. There's nothing we can do to get that peace. It's grace. It's God-given. You know, verse 18 then, I think highlights what this is trying to say. That we're dead. In verse 18, it says, For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. We had no part in earning it. It was completely through Christ. See, peace here, peace here doesn't fix all of our problems. Peace here, it's not a fix to our anxieties in this world. Peace here is not a religious method to make us more religious. Peace is access to God. Peace is his presence. Verse 14 says it clearly. Jesus himself is our peace. Peace is rooted in the hope we have through the cross. Now you know what? When I was young again, about eight years old, Okay, and as I was eight years old, I remember going shopping with my mom. And I was following my mom down the, down the carts. Or she was, she was putting stuff in, in, in the shopping cart. And you know what? I, uh, I got stuck in the cereal aisle. I was like Captain Crunch or, you know, Frosted Flakes. And I was like, oh, Apple Jacks. That's what I want. So I, I, I remember getting the Apple Jacks box. Okay? And running toward my mom and then realizing, oh, my gosh. I'm following the wrong mom. Okay? And I was like, wait, you're not my mom. Like, and so I was like starting to look for her, running down the aisles, looking up and down the aisles. I started going to other aisles looking for my mom. And then you know what happened? Because I got so scared. Okay, again, I was eight years old. Okay. I actually pooped in my pants. Okay. So like I, I'm there, right there in the middle of the aisle and I poop in my pants. It's just like, like you know, it's just right there, right? And I'm sitting there in my, in my shame. Okay. And then... And then, like, I, I'm searching, and I'm, at, I'm calling out my mom. Oh, ma, oh, ma, where are you? Oh, ma, what is so? Oh, ma, oh, ma, right? And then after a while, I finally hear, okay, it was probably only, like, 10 seconds, but for me, it felt like 10 minutes, right? <laughs> finally, after a while, what, she's, what, what I hear is, Micah, Micah. And you know what? That was peace. See, peace is that relationship that I had with my mom, Right? When I heard Micah, that was peace. It didn't clean anything up, okay, right? I was still stuck in my stuff, right? And you know what? Eventually, I had to get cleaned up, and it took time to clean myself up. And you know what? My mom helped me with that. But peace, it first started by hearing her voice, that relationship. You know the complete gospel? It's not simply personal salvation. It's not simply this peace I have with God and I'm good, I get to go to heaven. The complete gospel also says, hey, you know, I have this access to God. I have this access to love, to peace. Hey, you know what, you guys, I want to give you guys the access too. Let's build a relationship. The other person that racially socially, culturally, ethnically different person than you, it says, hey, you know what? The barrier that used to be there is no more. We can have peace. We can love each other. And you know what? Let's come together because we have the presence of Jesus. Access to God means we give access to others. You know, when you go to New York, you have to have the pizza. When you go to Philly, you have to have the cheesesteak. When you go to the south, you have to have barbecue. If you don't, it's incomplete. You know the gospel? I think it's kind of like that. 
Some of us live out personal salvation. Some of us live out racial reconciliation. The whole gospel is both. And the reason we can do that is because we are given access. And if we're given access, what stops us from simply giving that access to other people? Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.